Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about leading with self-care. And I am your, uh, your host, essentially. And I'm Jesse Saints here. I'll share a little bit more about me. And I have asked my friend, uh, Anna Ayobiojo, uh, to join me as well. And I'll share a little bit uh, more about her background. Um, but I'm so excited about uh, this content. I think it's going to be so helpful uh, for viewers, uh, whether you've joined us live or uh, you'll watch this at your leisure. I think this is so important um, at this point in time. Um, but why don't we get started? Okay. So again, I'm Jesse St. Cyr. I'm your host. I'm the principal owner of St. Cyr Consulting, which is um, an HR management consulting company focused on leadership development, management training, um, and coaching services. Um, I am an attorney by trade, have combined um, 20 years of experience as an HR executive and attorney. And one of the fun facts that I share about myself is uh, that I am the third of 10 children. And normally when I share that, people tend to gasp. Um, but I am finding that more and more people uh, will outdo me with that fun fact. Uh, but I'll share why uh, shortly. Uh, but a little bit more about St. Cyr Consulting. Again, leadership development management training. We provide faith-based training as well and executive coaching. Um, the website is uh, saintsirconsulting.com. And if you'd like to reach out uh, to us, um, you can email info at saintsirconsulting.com. Uh, because um, we are in the midst of a pandemic, and yes, while some states um, and many states have already reopened, uh, we continue to provide uh, remote and online services uh, to support you as a leader or as an employer. So my guest is Anna Ayobiojo, who I've known for some time. We've served together as leaders. Uh, she is a clinical coach, self-care consultant, a therapist, published author. She has the cutest kids uh, in the world. They're uh, what I call cabbage patch babies because they're absolutely adorable. Um, but Anna, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Can you share um, something about yourself that is not here? Yeah, and thank you so much, Jesse, for having me. I'm so excited about this webinar. Um, so my fun fact is that I am the baby, the youngest of 13 children. Okay, that still <laughs> takes my breath away. <laughs> that still yeah. takes my breath away. Um, okay, that's, um, I thought, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, but you're the baby, so you get all the benefits. Of, I do. Of all the other 12. So yeah. Congratulations. You lucked out. <laughs> I did. But I grew up by myself. It's a very unique um, experience because they were much older when I was born. Um, okay. But they still, you know, I still get the baby treatment. So. <laughs> if we could trade places for a couple of decades, I'd be happy. Wow. <laughs> so, just. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, as I mentioned before, you're a published author, um, and your book uh, is available on Amazon. Can you tell us why you wrote this book, uh, From Survival Mode to Greatness? Yes, I really felt led to share uh, my journey and my struggles with PTSD and severe depression. I struggled um, for over a decade from my teenage years into my early 20s, and it went undiagnosed and therefore untreated. And it really played a crucial part in, in my mental health in general. And it wasn't obvious, though. You know, it was one of those things where Outwardly, I appeared happy and joyful and um, as though I had no issues, but I struggled internally and really struggled, you know, more privately at home. No one knew except 
my mom, I think she had um, some concerns, but didn't know how to name it or really understand what was going on. And I just know that there's so many people that are struggling in silence. And I think that a lot of people can identify with my story, struggling in silence and um, feeling unseen. And I really want people to know that they're not the only ones and that they're not alone in this journey. Um, I share how I overcame um, you know, the symptoms. I, I no longer have symptoms or um, deal with any of those issues. And so I shared some practical tips in terms of um, creating not only um, this journey of wellness in your mental and emotional health, but really finding healing and, and um, living a life of thriving and greatness. That's great. That must be a great, um, great story, um, great lessons that you can uh, probably speak to. Can you share one of the lessons that you learned and that you share in the book? Yeah. Um, one of the things I always talk about probably too much is about village and support. Um, as someone who struggled with PTSD and severe depression, um, I had a, a lot of internal struggles trusting other people and believing that um, people were really there for me. You know, a lot of my childhood trauma spoke to the fact that people wouldn't show up to me, show up for me. And so my internal working model, which is what's created within us when we're um, children, it's like, you know, are people going to show up for me? No, mm. they're not. And then if people weren't able to show up for me for whatever reason, it's like that was reaffirmed and I further wanted to um, close in and not ask for help. So one of those things is like asking for help and creating a support system because we really weren't meant to do life alone, but many times we um, have this, this these voices that tell us you're, you're alone and nobody's going to be there for you. Um, and it's not even worth you speaking up kind of mm. thing. Yeah, and I think we're going to dig into that piece about speaking up um, and knowing that you're not alone. I think one of the biggest, um, probably most important thing um, in mental health is to actually share it um, and, and get support. Um, but why don't we get into uh, what is mental health first and foremost? Um, there, we hear about mental health in terms of mental illness a lot, and there's a lot of stigma around it. Um, for those of us, uh, those who do not know, uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, um, and there needs to be a lot of awareness around this. Can you help us understand, number one, what is mental health? Sure. Um, and I'm glad you brought up about the mental health and mental illness because sometimes they're used interchangeably and it's not the same thing. So mental health is the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional well-being of an individual. Mm -hmm. It's basically how people think, how they feel, how they act, and how they behave, as well as how they solve problems and overcome difficulties and connect with others on a social level. Um, mental health is something that everybody has. It's the same thing as physical health. Um, but mental illness is something that not everybody has. Only some struggle with that, the same as um, a physical illness. For example, some people may have a debilitating disease that impacts them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but not everybody struggles in that manner. And so it's the same thing. I, I picture mental health on this continuum. So mental health is in the middle and mental illness is on one end and mental wellness is on the other. And sometimes people move in the midst of that continuum and some people struggle with a mental illness that really impacts their day-to-day -day and impacts their ability to cope um, as well as to show up to school, show up to work, and those types of things. Um, and then there's other people in the continuum that possibly may not struggle to that extent, but they just have poor mental health and aren't able to um, get past certain thoughts and, and certain behaviors, like um, when a negative thought comes up, it'll consume them and it's difficult for them to replace that thought, for example, but it won't impact them to the point where they're laying in bed for two weeks at a time kind of thing. And then there's people who are absolutely thriving on the other end of mental wellness. They can see um, these feelings, these thoughts, and they're able to adjust properly and cope. And that doesn't mean either that people that are doing well mentally and emotionally are happy all the time. I think that's another misconception. I think it's just that we're all stressed and, you know, we just handle it in different ways. 
Um, and we all struggle in, at some point with mental health, you know, at some point we're worried or especially during this pandemic, this is a societal trauma. Um, we're all stressed and we're all um, worried and it just looks differently and it manifests differently and we all process it differently as well. Yeah, so then um, just because you're happy all the time doesn't mean that you have great mental health. You might be maybe pushing down some emotions and thoughts and um, just portraying happiness, but inside you're not, you're not okay. Yeah, you're forcing your behavior to be something that's opposite than when you, what you're really feeling or thinking. Okay, and then, uh, so if someone is grumpy all the time, they just might have a poor attitude, but doesn't necessarily mean that they have poor mental health or they have mental illness. Exactly. Okay, um, so that that person uh, who we might work with who might not be the jolliest of uh, colleagues <laughs> <laughs> uh, might just be a warm-hearted person inside and just needs a hug uh, yeah. or just needs to break the ice with someone. Um, and the person who's happy all the time may need to find ways to maybe process uh, what they're feeling and thinking. Yeah. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Okay. Probably, play. maybe not exactly <laughs> that way, but... <laughs> Okay, so then when we talk about mental health, how does that relate to, and you've touched on it um, and what you just shared there, but in terms of uh, one's thoughts, emotions, and behaviors? Yeah, so um, many times is these thoughts that arise and how they impact how you feel and then impact how you behave. So for example, um, I have two different examples, but I'll share the cat one. Um, so it's like you're walking down the street and you see a cat and your thought is like oh what's that and you're like oh okay it's a cat then your emotion is that of probably relief and then your behavior is to just keep on walking and keep on moving mm. um whereas if this thought now translates into that that's a, a mugger that's a thief then your emotions become anxious and fearful where your behavior is then going to be to run and hide somewhere. Mm. So, uh, so in terms of the thoughts, uh, the cat uh, example, uh, it's not one I would have thought of, but how do you address those thoughts um, when they happen, when they're not um, fully rational? How, how do you, what process do you go through to kind of cancel out those thoughts and replace them with ones that are healthy and effective? Yeah, I think depending on what the thoughts are, and let's say, for example, someone who struggles with, um, I guess, negative self-talk, and they're um, having thoughts of like, I'm really a poor leader and I'm not good at these things. I think it takes some training. I'm a fan of um, the writing things down. There's power in when we write things down. And so writing down on one side um, what those thoughts are, what the negative thoughts are, what the irrational thoughts are, and literally crossing them out so you can visualize yourself canceling them out. And then on the other side, coming up with thoughts that will replace that one. I am a great leader who is trying their best. And so when the moment arises, you will have that moment where you can pause and think back to that exercise and be able to replace those thoughts. It takes a lot of mindfulness to be able to pause in the moment and really um, quite literally visualize the crossing out and the replacing with that positive. Okay. Um, and then with emotions, and, and this is a little harder because um, some people say, I feel this way and so therefore I am. Mm. Um, how, how do you distinguish between a feeling and a feeling that's prolonged um, and, you know, not making that really part of your identity, but something that you have to assess? And I, and I don't know if I'm asking that question the right way. Um, but are your emotions your identity or are there things that have to be managed just like your thoughts? Maybe that's a better way to ask it. 
yeah um hopefully if i depending on what i how i answer you let me know um i think that you know emotions and feelings are not your identity it's a part uh it's a part of who you are and it's sometimes there's signals for things going on it's not a part of uh who you are i know i hear a lot of people saying um like i am depressed and i, I don't like to use that because you are not a, a depressed you have possibly the symptoms of depression um but you you as a person are not depressed and i think sometimes what, what happens is that um we take on these things and really embrace them and make them a part of our identity which makes it a lot more difficult to release uh for example i talk about this dark cloud that followed me um and it was like you know that aspect of being sad and being depressed all the time and i embraced it as my cloud and it was like ownership i was taking ownership of that and mm -hmm. i think if we separated it it was definitely a signal that there were many things inside of me um that were not fulfilling that we're not happy that we're not joyous um and it was an alert to that but it wasn't who i was and i think that um you know we should definitely allow the feeling to arise and validate it like you know okay i am feeling sad right now not i am sad but i'm feeling sad right now and being like it is okay to be sad for x y and z validating um just what you're feeling, but not embracing it to the point where um, it becomes a, a part of who you are. And mm -hmm. I think you asked about that prolonging. So mm -hmm. I think the the issue becomes, or, or a warning sign becomes when the sadness carries on for days on end um, and possibly for months on end. And that's where um, it's only one symptom. There's a, a category of things like, for example, for depression, um, but it's one thing that you should bring up like a light bulb like okay if i'm continuously sad and i'm not feeling um i'm never feeling happy um i should probably assess that and figure out what's going on there yeah uh and that's a that's a that's very helpful um honestly i'm learning as you are are sharing so this is this is really good uh to know that your emotions are part of you but they're not necessarily your identity yeah. and you can master your emotions you don't have to let them master you right yeah um and then in terms of behaviors can you talk about how our behaviors impact our mental health and i just want to make sure you can hear me clearly you just want to do a a yeah. quick tech check i can okay perfect yes yeah so in terms of behaviors how do your um behave how does our behaviors um impact our mental health and what can we do to improve that yeah i think our behaviors are a huge um they're all intertwined and all um interlinked and so our behavior is like if we engaged um for prolonged i feel like i have to explain this thoroughly there are some things that we engage in that aren't bad but i think that sometimes we just take it to an extreme so for example i'm, I'm thinking about like binge watching netflix binge watching netflix can be an aspect of self-care right but i think sometimes people use it um as a form to kind of numb out yeah. which is then when when it becomes the issue the same thing with food for example we need to eat we need to nourish ourselves but then it becomes a negative coping um skill for some people and they use food to to numb emotions or some people that struggle with eating disorders so it's it's these acts and and you know behaviors that we engage in that that are not bad it's just how we feel about them afterwards especially so if i'm sitting there and i'm trying to numb everything out now i feel worse about myself and it becomes a cycle where you know I, I let's say i mean i'm indulging in cake every single day and i really i have no self-control i feel really bad about myself i feel like i, <laughs> I hit something there. Maybe, maybe you just told on me <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't cake it was pies and lots of pies <laughs> lots of pies <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, you know, the pies are not bad, but you know, it's like we're eating pies. Okay, I'll change it. <laughs> I'm sure you'll say something else and you'll hit on that too. That's okay. 
<laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> but so, yeah. the thing is, I think during the pandemic, it's just, okay, a lot of us are still at home. Some people yeah. who have underlying health conditions will continue to be at home. Um, children are at home. Businesses have been impacted. Um, the way we work has changed. The way we shop has changed. Yeah. And while some people are out and they're just kind of going back to status quo, a lot of people are not going to go back to status quo. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. But it's the new normal and it's trying to adjust to that and uh, the uncertainty that comes with yeah. having to adjust and not knowing when this will end because yeah. you know there's the fall and there's flu season and all these different factors yeah. um are impacting um our ability to self-care yes. and not eat pies and cakes yeah and dos ice cream yeah. i know it is very difficult to engage in self-care and that's the piece that comes in that helps us to really um do well mentally and emotionally is when we're physically our behaviors we're engaging in self-care but you're so right that i mean nobody's been through this and so there everyone's feeling that level of uncertainty that level of worry for some is probably uh, maximized let's say for someone struggling with anxiety um and so we're limited in terms of what we can do for self-care right like if i go to the gym and i have that time for myself gyms are not open right now and working out at home is you know effective for some but it's completely different we're caused to be very creative around self-care which um, for people that didn't engage in it before to be creative about something like that it's even more difficult and so since we're talking about self-care how important is it to mental health yeah self-care is so important to um, mental health when we engage in these self-care behaviors and activities um, something about it reaffirms our self-worth it boosts our self-esteem um, and improves our self-awareness and a com combination of all of that just creates this positive effect on our mindset and when you know when we engage in them we are able to decrease stress, we are able to um, improve our moods, and then we're recharged, we're refreshed, and we're be better able to show up into our jobs and our relationships. Um, you know, when we're our best us, we can be the best for everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, Ed, can you share some ways that uh, we can self-care? And I'm happy to share some of the things that I've done besides eating pies um to uh to maintain um some self-care uh creating some routine to make sure that i'm decompressing and i'm um just relaxing uh, but I, i'd love to hear what your thoughts are especially when everybody's home yeah, I think especially during this time is that aspect of practicing self-compassion, mm. being okay with the fact that right now, whatever it is that you're doing for yourself, which gives you a little more leeway to engage in Netflix as much as you want, because yeah. there are difficult, they're, they're difficult times, you know, so I think however, not feeling guilty about it. So however you are engaging in that um, it's okay, but I think also being aware of it because it's then going to be harder to then have to transition later to not being able to binge watch Netflix later on. Mm -hmm. um, I think definitely if you're able to go for walks um, with your masks on and depending on where you are, like I know if you're in the city, it's probably a little bit more difficult. There's yeah. more cluster of people, um, but if you're able to safely go out for walks, um, that will definitely boost overall physically and mentally and emotionally. Um, you know, I know we're all Zoomed out, but engaging in Zoom conversations and family conversations via Zoom and groups and even having date nights via Zoom. Um, my kids actually got to play a game with their friend um, via um, the computer and FaceTime. So using technology as a tool and using it to your advantage. I think especially as we're working from home and we're schooling from home, having if you can separate areas um, where you're able to just leave school there, leave work there, um, and then, you know, closing your computer and putting it completely away so that you're not working, um, you know, all hours of the night and just setting boundaries around like, okay, I'm going to work even it's 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. or whatever long hours you want to have, but making sure that you have some time for yourself. You know, I'm a woman of faith, so 
waking up earlier than everybody else as a mom is important and filling my cup up first and making sure that I'm praying and, you know, I'm meditating and having that moment of just silence without everyone else interrupting, I think is very important. And I know you wanted to share some ways that you've been engaging in self-care. Yeah, and I think you touched on some of the factors of that everyone is home, right? So trying to find some space to uh, exercise self-care is, is very important. I, uh, my, most of my family is on the East Coast, so I'm here and it's just me. Uh, so I, I can kind of self-care a little bit more. But being a person who likes to achieve a lot, um, I always find that downtime is a way for me to do more. Um, and so I have to balance that. Uh, the need to be productive and engaging and helpful with the need to say, it's okay. Uh, you don't have to have all the answers. You can't help everybody. Um, and so I've, I've decided to do this a while ago. Mondays are my relaxed days. Um, those, that's the day that I plan, um, that I, you know, look forward, be more strategic. Um, but I don't, put too much on myself, right? Um, Sundays, um, I'm a person of faith as well. And so um, Sundays is uh, faith, family, and fun. I love that. Yeah. So um, I normally would go to church, but now that we're home, watch church service. And then um, later on in the day, it's a Zoom call. Uh, with my family, and um, we're able to get my maternal grandparents on the call. Uh, so my grandparents are on Zoom, which is super cool. And they take they take um, center stage, and it's like they do whatever they want. And, it's <laughs> um, and uh, so that's and then I try to take walks. Um, I have asthma, I've shared that with uh, folks before, and so I have to be extra careful. Um, mm. But I live in an area that's pretty uh, spacious. There's, you know, a lot of things that we could do outdoors, but I can take walks uh, safely. And I, I watch for um, just f foot traffic. Um, yeah. If there are too many people out, I won't go out. Um, at certain times of the day, there's light traffic, and that's when I'll go out and I'll put a mask on. Um, so those are some of the things that I do to to exercise self exercise self care. Yeah, yeah. I um, love your Sunday setup. Hmm? I love your Sunday setup. Yes, yes. Um, and I didn't add food in there, but uh, yeah, it's it's essentially faith, family, food, and fun. Um, oh. Yeah. Yes, and that's when I'll go out um, uh, with friends or family or go to my mom's house and, and have a good Sunday dinner. Um, but again, since I can't really travel right now, uh, we adjust. Um, so I'll watch her cook and salivate and watch and can't do anything about it. But anyway, so we've kind of touched on the fact that everyone is home um, and finding ways to self-care. And we've talked about some examples of that. But um, I find that there, you have three, um, three beautiful children. I have a lot of siblings who have, um, half of them have children. And they're working professionals. Um, they're leaders in their organizations. Um, they have children at home, they have spouses, and they're homeschooling. And while the teachers are really doing the homeschooling, they have to make sure that their kids are set up and prepared and ready to go. Yeah. Um, how, how do you self-care when you have to do that as well? And what do you do with the children? Yeah, I mean, it's been a lot of, you know, trial and error. <laughs> I know mm -hmm. that when this thing first started, there was this little schedule going around and everybody, I was like, myself included, I was like, I'm going to do that. And that was a fail. <laughs> so I think the biggest way, you know, that I self-care for the entire family is the check-ins in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, just really assessing where everybody is at mentally and emotionally, because there were days where, um, 
you know, and, and I had to assess because one of my children really doesn't like school altogether. So every day would be a day off if it was up to him, but just days where, you know, they weren't really up to it. And so I would probably have homeschool in the afternoon instead of the morning and kind of adjusting or saying, you know what, we need a break. Um, let's hang out as a family and prioritizing everyone's mental and emotional health and really just not doing anything and having them get to it, even though it builds up, but having them get to the work later on. Um, and, you know, for the most part, we had a schedule, you know, we would wake up, they would um, do their work in the morning, and then we would take a break. And um, my husband and I broke it up in shifts. And so I would have the morning shift so that he can have his meetings, and then he would have the afternoon shift, and I would, was able to work, work on my projects or my podcast or things of that nature. And then we come together in the evening, um, you know, we hang out outside or, you know, we make dinner together and, you know, we would just have that time for ourselves. And then I make sure, well, the little one, I have a baby, make sure she's in bed yeah. at an early hour. And then I would let the boys have a little bit of technology um, because that's how they would talk to their friends. And that's when my husband and I would hang out. Um, so we had we had a good flow, good routine. We actually finished school here um, a few days ago. So, well, oof, God bless you. Um, and so, um, one of the questions uh, we got was um, about self caring, especially for single parents. Yeah. Um, who do not have a spouse or a partner um, with them, and they are managing everything. Um, yeah. by themselves and they can't drop off the kids to grandma's house or auntie's house because everybody's in quarantine um, or or they have to be careful because the kids have underlying health conditions. How, how do you self-care then? Yeah, and that's really tough because I'm grateful, you know, that I'm able to balance this out as a team um, because it's a lot on one person. Um, so I definitely get it and I feel for our single parents. I think that as a single parent being okay with, um, I know we want to limit and reduce technology time, but being okay if you give them an extra 15, 30 minutes of technology so that you can step away and take a deep breath or, um, you know, whatever it is that you can do, incorporating the exercise with the family, but then having, um, maybe 30 minutes to yourself to sort of, you know, pray or meditate or, um, do something for yourself. Um, although you can't leave them in the car, you can go for a drive with them and just the change of scenery can help. Um, and definitely when they're all asleep, making sure that they're asleep at, at a, a decent hour, seven, eight o'clock. I know it's not fun for them, but you would be able to have that time in the evening to yourself, you know, and I think another thing that it will take practice, but it's possible is incorporating everyone, no matter how little they are, um, into that evening. I know that post dinner can be crazy. You just want to get them to bed and then you're left with a dirty kitchen and everything, mm -hmm. but incorporating them in that aspect of teamwork so that you have dinner together as a family and then you clean up everyone all together. And then by the time they're in bed, everything is, is clean and not perfect because we do our best and, and, you know, not having to be like, okay, I'm going to give up my me time so that this kitchen can be clean, kind of prioritizing you over, um, like a clean house, for example, something. Yeah. Gotta give. Something's yeah. got to give. And I will say that, um, you can't help everybody else. If really you have, you don't have the state of mind or you don't have the energy to, yeah. you know, that, um, that instruction on the airplane that you have to put your uh, your mask on, your oxygen mask on before you help somebody else put their oxygen mask on is um, very applicable to life. Yes. You know, you can't be so, and I'm, I'm saying this and also uh, <laughs> reflecting at the same time that you can't help everyone else and deplete yourself Right. Um, because you're not going to be around. Um, yeah. And so it's important to self-care. So this is something that is still an area um, of uh, growth and improvement for me. Yeah. Um, 
And, and so that's really important. And I love some of the things that you shared there. And uh, one of my sisters is this fantastic um, person. Um, she does a lot of the things that you talk about, um, uh, taking rides, uh, driving to the beach. Um, mm. She has, uh, her kids have to read for one hour every day. Yeah. Um, and that gives her time to, to step away. Um, thankfully, there's, she has uh, others who uh, live, um, family members who live with her. And so they can kind of, you know, here, can you watch my kids for a minute and, you know, while I take a breather. And so I think those are great, great ideas. Um, so, and we'll go through the rest of these uh, factors uh, kind of together because they they all overlap uh the thing is uh some actually almost all of the states i think at this point have reopened or are planning a, a phased reopening yeah. um so there's the anxiety that comes with that there are financial concerns uh for those who have tens of millions of people have lost their jobs businesses have been severely impacted um how do you deal with the anxiety of it all and self-care? Yeah, and I think that, you know, they kind of go hand in hand as dealing with the root of the anxiety, um, you know, letting those things come to the surface. What is it that you're anxious about and kind of naming them and labeling, um, you know, I don't know what school's going to look like when it reopens or I have all of these employees. Um, and I think what's going to be the most helpful is for having a support system in advance um, for families, as well as for schools, as well as for leaders um, and organizations, just to have a support system that you can talk these thoughts through. Mm. You know, um, I believe in the power of journaling. So definitely having that aspect where you can kind of journal these emotions, but also having a safe place for you to be able to voice these, these thoughts because, um, if you're in, if you have these anxious thoughts constantly going it's going to be hard for you to be able to execute effectively as a leader mm -hmm. um and so dealing with those emotions and filling your cup up first which you know dealing with the thoughts and then um some of the self-care physically um so that you can lead by example ultimately whether you have to lead in the home or lead outside the home people are, are going to be watching you. your kids are going to be watching you. your employees are, are watching you to see how you deal with this which is an additional pressure but it's incentive to engage in self-care yourself um as well as you know therapy is always there having someone that can help you process these things because for some um they may have already had anxiety prior to this, and this is just exacerbating the symptoms. So things could be getting worse. I think it's okay to get a therapist, to get even a mental uh, and emotional wellness coach, someone mm -hmm. uh, professional that can help you and walk um, alongside you as you're leading others. And that's good. So the the one of the things that I, I, I would share here is, especially for leaders and employers, um everyone is at home and so i think there needs to be an adjustment or a, a reset if you will around uh, expectations mm -hmm. again focusing on outcomes and not um, on employees being available all the time you know I, I think this is an opportunity to kind of elevate how we engage people uh, how we engage uh, the workforce how we engage employees knowing that they're responsible adults you want to give them the benefit of the doubt most yeah. people do want to do a good job and um, you know having uh, spoken to a lot of organizational leaders and uh, working professionals who say they're working longer hours now mm. uh, because they're at home and they want to stay on top of things and also that employers are giving them more work to do because they feel that well there's more time because they're at home mm. and this is where there needs to be a balance yeah and that you want to kind of keep a similar schedule to what uh, was done before the pandemic so that people are not exhausted and stretched mm. uh, unnecessarily while they're trying to manage all of these other factors uh, that we talked about um and you talked about emotional um or mental health coaching 
and support, this is a great time for employers to offer their employee assistance programs and remind employees that they have that available to them. Some health insurance um, plans include that. So it's something that they want to take advantage of. And with employee assistance programs, some of them are so robust that they do also include um, information on elder care, child care, things like that. And while they may not be able to provide child care in person, they may have some other things that um, parents can do uh, while their kids are at home uh, to help balance all of that out. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the, the reopening um, and the financial concerns, I think it's so important. Information is, um, is power, right? Knowledge is power, really. So when employers uh, provide helpful information to their employees, I think it helps in terms of the anxiety, yeah. right? Um, just to know what's going on, that there is a plan, and if there's no plan, that they're working on it, and yeah. that they're keeping um, their employees top of mind. I think that's really, really important. So communication I think is really key, making sure resources are available um, to employees um, and letting them know that you care. You talked about being Zoomed out. Um, people don't want to be on any of these platforms right now. They're just like, ah, I don't want to do another one of these. Right. Um, and I've talked to so many people who are on Zoom call after Zoom call, and not just Zoom, but they're a WebEx or a Microsoft team or go to meeting. And it's one thing after another. And that's just not normal. Right. Um, when we were in the workplace, we didn't have meeting after meeting after meeting. In some cases he did, but yeah. there was a, a, an opportunity to go and take a break, take a walk, go and eat exactly. something, yeah. you know? Um, so trying to, to mimic that to the extent possible and adjusting expectations, um, I think is really important. Uh, and if with the financial concerns, I think EAP services also have some resources, uh, again, depending on how robust um, uh, the services are, but maybe they have some financial counseling so people know uh, what's available. You know, yeah. Department of Unemployment and all of these um, uh, government stimulus or incentive, uh, not incentive, but um, uh, care, the CARES Act and PPP and all those things are available. So if people are being laid off, that they have resources and that there's mental health support for them as well. I think that's really important. Um, and then lastly, we talked about um, kind of those who are in leadership roles in their organization. I think it's, it's so important um, that leaders take care of themselves and it's hard to take care of yourself when you're responsible for taking care of someone else. Mm -hmm. And it's not just organizational responsibility in terms of an employer or business, but if you're a parent, you're a leader. Yeah. Right. And you're responsible uh, for little ones and you're responsible for a household. Um, how, how do leaders take care of themselves while they're taking care of everyone else? And you've kind of touched on a lot of what we can do to, to, to take care of ourselves. But anything uh, specific to uh, leaders, especially organizational leaders? Yeah, I think the part of self-care will be knowing what you enjoy and what you need um, because it'll probably look differently. Um, you know, you probably enjoyed going to the gym and things of that nature, but really assessing what it is that you need um, in the space of mental, emotional, as well as physical and kind of planning in advance, sort of like a self-care plan, you know, um, like I've noticed my mood is X, Y, and Z when I'm in that space, um, having a list of people that you can call. Um, mm. who can you rely on? Because some people you have, um, friends that you, let's say you go shoe shopping with, but you wouldn't necessarily talk about your problems with, um, and things like that. You know, who are the people in your life that reinvigorate you, that you have a conversation with, and they just fill you with life just in a conversation. Um, so identifying those people ahead of time, um, also because a lot of people will be sort of dealing with, um, 
kind of the same thing. So you don't want to just have one person that you talk to and, and laying your burdens, let's say on just one person, but having that support system in place and, um, having them in mind and having a few people, um, that you can go to. So the village, the village, yes, yes, that village mindset, that is really what I think we're missing, right? I think that's one of those things that's being compromised right now because we can't be around people. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the thing that we need to preserve is preserve unity because we are not going to be able to move forward um, on our own and isolated, um, even if it's just mentally and emotionally isolated and not reaching out for help. So that village mentality is definitely huge. And, um, you know, the same for families, having that village mindset and having other families that can help you during these times um and you know having that plan in advance with the physical mental and emotional um components and what are the activities that you enjoy you know do i enjoy um you know yoga do i prefer heavy lifting um and making sure that you make time for yourself and literally blocking it in your calendar as though it was a meeting because a meeting with yourself is probably more important than any meeting um you know my favorite quote ever is that you can't pour from an empty cup mm. one of the things that i struggled with was feeling guilty about self-care because i'm like you know taken away from all these different things especially as a wife and a mother but i realized early on that if my cup is empty i'm just giving out fumes i'm giving the worst of me but if i fill my cup up first with whatever makes my soul happy then i'm able to overflow onto others and they're getting the best of me and that's actually you just answered one of the questions that we had is just how do you deal with guilt especially yeah. as a parent who has to work and provide and you want to be engaging uh your children as well so you've answered the question already oh which is man. Great. <laughs> yeah um and the another question was on um you know when you're a leader in your organization but you report up to another leader and that leader is not really focused on mental health and really engaging employees how do you manage up uh around self-care and mental health yeah that can be really difficult and really trying and um really trying for your own mental health because mm -hmm. you're, you know that this is good for you but you're it's almost like you're not allowed to engage in that but i think there's so much power in like leading by example even to yeah. leading to leaders above you um and once they see you engage in self-care and they see you let's say your mood is improved and and you are more active and you're more effective and productive um they'll soon begin to ask questions as to why that is um and i think that you know having the conversation in different formats and um possibly having someone from outside the organization come in and do a presentation for example um you know you would have to convince them first but, um, you know, having someone else provide the information so that they're able probably better receive it, be able to receive it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that definitely leading by example can be so powerful because they'll realize, um, you know, that person has uh, the right idea and maybe I should engage in it as well. Yeah. And, and I would say in terms of um, setting boundaries, um, it's just important to respectfully push back. Yeah. Um, if there's just too much being asked in a webinar I did in March um, around managing the realities of telework when everybody's home, um, I, I recommended one of the questions, is how, how do we manage up? And one of the things I recommended is to maybe go back uh, to your boss and say, hey, these are the things that we're working on. Yeah. Um, and these are priorities and these are not. Or maybe we can work on these later and we can kind of assess where we are with these projects. But my team is doing the best that they can. We're doing the best that we can. We just really need to uh, reset um, yeah. and respectfully push back. Making sure that people are productive, but respecting the fact that these are unusual times. Yeah. Um, and I think human beings need some reprieve. Um, so I think setting, setting, um, some boundaries, respectfully pushing back, um, is important and reminding, um, leaders that, uh, 
the people are the number one asset in the organization. Without them, um, really everything will fall apart. Um, and it does, it does cost money uh, to recruit and uh, fill positions. So why not just engage and really uh, manage work differently and engage the employees so that they're not, um, so the work is appropriate um, and they're not burnt out uh, because they're doing so much um, at, at the same time. I think it's it's a, a balance. Um, and establishing a, a new normal um, around that, I think, is, is very, very important. Um, not trying to do what was our, always done, right. but recognizing that things have changed. How do we leverage technology better? How do we respect the fact that everyone's dealing with all of these factors at home? Um, how do we remain productive, um, but also respecting the fact that people are adults? Um, they will do their jobs. You have to continue to, to manage and do performance management and all that stuff and keep people accountable. Um, but establishing a new normal is so important. I think that helps leaders too, um, to not feel the burden of having to do what was always done. Yeah. But to be creative, to take a step back and say, okay, things are shifting. How can we adapt? How can we be more agile um, and create that new normal? Anything you want to add there? Absolutely. I definitely think you're right, um, especially in terms of not wanting to force what was already done, because we've seen um, during this quarantine that um, it wasn't really working. You know, we're able to be more productive. You know, some people working remotely, if you can keep some of that and keep some people remotely, it would be more beneficial for them. Um, and cut costs in some other areas that you can later use for something else. And I think that us forcing um, ourselves to go back to what was and what we wanted to be um, will create a lot of tension and it will be even worse for your mental and emotional health because yeah. it will be this, this war uh, within you with trying to really control um, the situation and what was, I think, being open to the idea that it will be a new normal and being mm -hmm. okay with that because we don't know what that looks like. And I think a lot of people just try to control um, because uncertainty is, you know, it, it is worrisome. But if, I think if we embrace it and, um, and are flexible, I think it'll definitely be a whole lot easier. And I think the flexibility is so important because the image that came to mind was, you know, two shapes that can't really fit into each other, you know, um, and maybe you're trying to put a box in the, in the circle or a circle in a box and it's like, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, and now how can we reshape uh, that image um, and, and do something new, maybe be brave and do something that hasn't been done before. Right. Um, and this is a great time, I think, for leaders to tap into their workforce and get ideas mm -hmm. on how to approach things differently. And so transitioning back to work will look different. Doesn't mean you have to go back to a brick and mortar. Um, in fact, if you can't really ensure the safety of the employees, it's, cre it's creating more risk and exposure for the company. So it might be a good thing to say, okay, if we have the capabilities to work from home, let's work from home and make sure that we're, uh, you know, people are not burnt out. Uh, Google has um, uh, announced that their employees are going to be working from home, I think, through uh, to at least 2021. Um, and I'm sure a lot of companies will follow suit. Um, certain uh, universities have um, been uh, deciding on what to do there, but have indicated that they're going to move to uh, reopen next year. So transi transitioning back to work doesn't have to mean transitioning back to a building. Right. Um, if you can telework, telework. Um, if you have to go back into a building because the business model is such that people have to be in a, 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 a place, uh, then making sure that, um, uh, that uh, 
all of the 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 guidelines are adhered to that um, the building is cleaned out uh, that the facilities are, are cleaned out, that you have experts to do that, that you can maintain social distancing, that there's um, sanitizer and people can wash their hands um, and um, do all the things that they, can, they, they need to do while, again, uh, following the CDC guidelines. It's really, really important at this point. But like I said before, if people can work from home, there's really no need for them to go back into a, a workplace um, at this time. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, transitioning back to work, um, there is anxiety. You've talked about this before. There is anxiety. Uh, people do have underlying health conditions. So HR departments should be managing that um, and providing guidance to hiring uh, to managers on um, how they can deal with each situation um, and having a dialogue is very very important part of the process so um, uh, we're coming to the end here uh, of this really important conversation um, and one question um, that i missed was how do you um, engage um, employees who have lost loved ones, who weren't able to see um, their family um, and their, their family members passed away. H how, do you, how do you help them? Yeah, and that was a really difficult one, especially because it is not, um, you know, they're grieving, but it's not a, a typical death. It's one um, that was caused by this, um, you know, by COVID-19 which everyone was fearful of. So that can possibly cause some further fears that they already had. And now they're not even able to have a proper funeral and burial the way we traditionally envision. Um, so there's a lot of loss around, um, you know, not only the family member, but the experience of being able to say bye in person, and even be able to mourn um, with family members. Now you're mm -hmm. mourning possibly via FaceTime or via Zoom. So there's so many different layers to that and being mindful of um, the fact that they may not even know what they need in that moment but being open and leaving the door open to them to let you know what they need um, and providing support if your organization is able to um, provide um, you know any type of um, you know pay for mental health services or anything of the sort so that they they're able to process those different layers of grief because it'll be um a process you know from denial and all these different um things and i think that you know that person will definitely need a lot of time and flexibility to be able to re-engage in the work in the way that they feel best yeah and i i personally unfortunately know too many people um, who have lost uh, parents, um, uncles, uh, siblings uh, in, in this uh, pandemic. And it's just, it's really sad knowing that they weren't able to see uh, their loved ones um, up until literally last week. So um, it, it's still tough to keep hearing more and more people passing while uh, the states are reopening. So uh, the balancing act is very important. Um, and I'll, I'll reemphasize this, making sure resources are available, giving employees time um, and, and just checking in, uh, just to say we care, I think is really, really important. Um, so final thoughts for individuals, um, and families. One of the things you talked about before is creating systems of support. Any other thoughts around that? Yeah, I think that is going to be uh, monumental in terms of how we proceed forward, whether it's a new normal or, 
you know, if things go back to normal, which I doubt, um, whatever it is, it's it's going to be completely different in how we adjust. We're, we're now accustomed to doing life the way we've been doing it for three months, and, and so it's going to take time. Um, but for families, being able to rely on other families in terms of, you know, if their children are going to school, um, they possibly need a little bit more support in getting them there. Because children, you know, I know we didn't talk too much about children, but children are going to have a difficult time readjusting as well. Yeah. And so it possibly means behavioral issues um, because that's how it manifests for them. That's how they communicate. So having behavioral issues and having backup of who can help you with pickup if your commute is too far and if your job isn't allowing flexibility for you to pick up your children um, and even um, communing together so that you're able to process, you know, what was that, the three months like and what is the transition like to really um, just be in this this village idea for families and then for organizations as well um providing spaces even um if you return back to a building or even if you're doing it virtually creating spaces where let's say they're having a a, a lunch and talk and you have that that space where they're able to just vent and not do anything else but be in a space where they can talk about um what they're feeling and also having support for your employees outside support, you know, having people that will come and um, present on self-care or that they will engage them in self-care activities and teach them new ways to engage in self-care. Because I think we think, um, you know, working out and eating healthy, but there are different types of things like engaging in art therapy, which possibly you can have someone that can come in and teach them these new um, skills. So definitely that collaborative approach is going to be monumental in, in how we move forward yeah those i mean the when you mentioned that the children um you know they're they're adjusting too um and so that's really important that frankly is um um a topic it's a really a standalone topic because children are different ages and some have missed their graduations and um that sense of accomplishment and and celebration is not the same uh, they're trying their best. Um, kids are not able to see their 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 friends, and staring at a computer um, throughout the day it's not normal. Um, and uh, so the, there's some work to be done there. And I'm sure a lot of school uh, leaders, uh, educational systems are are working on that. Um, in fact, I one of my nieces. Um, um, who goes to to a very very amazing school in Boston? Um, they've um, they don't they're not on um, Zoom or whatever throughout the day. They're on for a few hours um, in the day and a few hours every day. Um, but they they've learned to kind of balance that out. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so in terms of leaders. Um, providing the extra downtime um, to integrate the self-care uh, and wellness activities, not just for the people who work with them and for them, but for themselves. Right. And we've said this several times, you know, um, if you're empty, you don't have anything uh, to give. If you're not putting on your oxygen mask, you can't really help somebody else. Right. Um, you can't be depleted and continue to give. Um, it's something I have to keep on working on. Um, and I think uh, leaders who care about people will always try to help, but you can't help if you're not around. Um, and so making sure you can get through this um, health in a healthy and safe way is very important uh, for leaders as well. But communication is so important, even if you don't have all the answers, I think leaders just communicating to reassure people that you're doing your best. I think it's sometimes all people need. You know, I've led in many crisis uh, moments and I find that people just want to know that you care. They want information uh, to help them uh, figure things out and they need to know that there's a plan or that someone's working on a plan. Yeah. Yeah, to move forward. Um, so thank you so much. Anna, uh, for uh, joining me on this very, very important conversation. Um, I would highly recommend everyone go out and get this book. 
this was a very, very rich, rich conversation. One that I don't think um, uh, we're doing enough mm -hmm. on. Um, but your book is available on Amazon. Yeah. Um, again, it's from survival mode to greatness. And how much is the book? It's fifteen ninety five. Fifteen ninety five, and so you can get it. Everybody knows how to get on Amazon. Um, and if uh, folks would like to hear more from you, um, follow you, where can they find you? Yes, on Instagram and Facebook, I am Anathy Usai Riojo, my whole name that's listed there. Um, you can find me on both of those platforms. And um, definitely follow me and add me as a friend so that you can be updated when uh, my website comes up, which is soon. Okay. And you have a podcast that you're doing. I do, the Community Well Podcast. Yes. Great Thank podcast. You. Make sure to follow that. And for me, as, as I've shared before, you could get all of my information on stsierconsulting.com, uh, info at stsierconsulting.com. I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and Instagram. Um, and if you'd like uh, more support and services, uh, feel free uh, to reach out. But look, look out for upcoming uh, webinars on leadership, um, I'm really excited about uh, these webinars because uh, my goal is to build transformative leaders who think about their positions differently and are uh, stewards of talent. Um, so look, for, look out for that. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing that important information uh, with you. But thank you again, Anna, for this uh, amazing conversation. Um, like I said, I think it's very, very rich and will be helpful to so, so many people. Um, before we go, um, one final uh, question that just came. If someone is living with someone who has a mental illness uh, or have mental health challenges, are there any resources uh, that you would recommend to them? Yeah, um, I can list them out definitely. Um off of the top of my head. I know we're doing a lot of things virtually right now. So BetterHelp um, is one that I think they're still providing a discount during this time. So it's a great resource, uh, not only for the individual that you live with, but also for yourself and possibly family or, or couples therapy um, could be helpful. Okay. And I can provide further information or resources as well. Okay. And the Good Samaritan, I've, I've, uh, we've partnered with that, my former employers have. Um, EAP programs, the employee assistance programs are probably a great place to go uh, for uh, some uh, resources or they can recommend some resources to you. Your place of worship might be another great place um, to go. Um, they're prob they may be offering services. I know my church uh, does offer that, that service uh, even now. So uh, there are probably resources even with your state. Um, if you go to your state website in Massachusetts, it's mass.gov and uh, Texas. Um, I don't remember the website, but probably different states have different resources available um, and, and uh, special hotlines that you can call uh, during this time. So that's all we have. I think um, this conversation was great and I hope and trust that it will be helpful uh, to you as well. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining. Thank you, Jesse. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Okay.